Welcome to our service here at First Baptist Church of Stanton. We are certainly glad that you are here. I don't know about you, but I am thankful for the sunshine and warmer weather. Yes. Uh, the snow is leaving. What more could we ask? And uh, spring is certainly on its way. Just a couple of announcements. The regular Bible studies this uh, week. And then uh, a week from tonight, March 14th at 5 o'clock, is the movie Facing the Giants. Uh, please use this opportunity to invite uh, folks that uh, you might think that would uh, enjoy the movie and appreciate it. Uh, that would be great. And um, also there is a uh, Kelly Cook update with uh, a celebration of life uh, at uh, the Magnify Church over in Rockford. Uh, you can read that and it gives the time of the service. And uh, if you wish to go, I'm sure the family would appreciate that. And then uh, we're using the envelopes for the Deacon Fund. So if you want to contribute to that this morning, you can put that offering in the envelope and put it in one of the boxes in the back of the church. I think that is all the announcements I need to take care of. Uh, let's open our time with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice today that we can uh, be here today to worship you, to sing your praises, and to have a message from God's Word, and also to commemorate the sacrifice on Calvary that was uh, made for, on our behalf for our sins through communion, and I pray that uh, you would bless the service today. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the warmer weather. And uh, we thank you that uh, even despite cold weather, we uh, have warm homes and uh, clothing. And we know that there are so many people, even in our surrounding areas, that uh, don't have those privileges. We want to continue to pray for the Cook family and uh, just bring comfort to their uh, hearts today in the home going of Kelly, uh, be with uh, Kelly's parents, Bob and Patty, and the rest of the family, that you would surround them with your lo love and comfort. We continue to pray for those in our fellowship who continue to struggle with health issues, for Margaret and Avis and <coughs> other folks, and uh, for the trial that uh, Brian and Kim are going through uh, this week uh, with uh, Elizabeth's death. Thank you that Sherry was able to make a safe trip to California and as she begins her work there in Oakland at the hospital that you would bless her time there and uh, use her talents for your glory and your honor. We think of those who are serving on the mission field today, and I just ask that you would be with all of our supporting missionaries and that you would uh, bless them today as they serve you. We pray for our nation today. Oh God, we are certainly in need of a, uh, a God that uh, rules and overrules in the events of our country. And we thank you that uh, you're, you are the, that great God that people can trust. And I pray that uh, people in leadership would recognize who you are and have a respect for you and a love for you. We commit our service to you today in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand for the scripture reading? It's 1 John 4, 7 to 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, 
that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought so ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Amen. We have come into his house. are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let's just pray. Oh, 
the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. I Just by a quick way of review, we uh, are coming to the next section in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 31 through 38. And I've entitled the sermon, Love is the Greatest. But I want to remind us that from chapter 13 to 17, four chapters worth, all happen in the span of hours. It's all covered under what uh, theologians have termed the upper room discourse. This is where they had um, the, the Passover supper. This is where Jesus instituted uh, communion. This is where he washed the disciples' feet. And as we looked at last week, this is also where Judas was given leave. He was identified to John um, when he asked, Lord, who is it? Who is it that's going to betray you? And he says, it is to the one whom this morsel I dip and then hand it to him. And that was Judas. And if you remember, Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. And he left. After eating the morsel, he left. So we need to keep those two things in particular in mind as we go through the entire upper room discourse. The fact that first of all Jesus humbled himself beyond no other Hebrew ever to take on the role and the appearance of a servant by wrapping a towel around him and washing the disciples feet. Just a remarkable display and the fact that Jesus once again not for the first time mind you identified who his betrayer was going to be and he has now left their presence so now it's just Jesus and 11 disciples in this upper room so that brings us to this passage and before we begin let's go to the Lord in prayer <clears throat> Father, God, as we come to your word, I pray that uh, you would bless it. I ask that you would sanctify it into our lives. That your truth would change us in such a way that we would be transformed in our minds, in our hearts, in our thinking, and in our behavior to become more of the people that you desire and have called us to be, that we might become like Christ. So God, bless this word into our lives. Sanctify it. Sanctify us in your truth. And we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was... this five-year-old boy. And he had become sick with some strange disease and uh, he miraculously overcame it and he got all better. But then his older uh, eight-year-old sister became sick and the doctors quickly discovered that it was the same illness, but she was not getting better. And the doctor's thinking that perhaps a transfusion from this boy, that his body has built up the antibodies to fight off this disease, 
might save her life. So they asked the boy, would you be willing to donate your blood to save your sister? And he thought about that. And he thought about it. And he said, yes, I will do it. I will do it. So with uh, wasting no time at all, they, they rush him into the room where his sister was and they hook him up to an IV and they start um, a patient-to-patient -patient transfer of blood uh, just to get it directly into her as quickly as possible. And um, as the color immediately starts to return to the girl's cheeks, the little boy looks over at his sister lying there as he's lying down and he smiles and then he looks over at the doctor and he says, how long? How long what? How long until I die? The little boy thought he was being asked to donate all his blood. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. That's love. That's love. This sermon is about love is the greatest. Take a look with me at the first two verses of this passage, John chapter 13, verses 31 through 32. Therefore, when he had gone out, now this is Judas, Judas had just left. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, referring to himself. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. In just two verses, that's a lot of glory, right? And, and I love the way John writes. It's often been described as very circular. If you don't understand what he's saying at first, just keep going. He comes back around and he'll say it again in a slightly different way. It's just like rolling waves. It just comes and, and it just keeps going. Uh, so it's not repetitive for emphasis sake. It's nearly repetitive, but from a different perspective to make sure that those of us who don't understand right away get a chance to hear it from a slightly different angle. I just love the way John writes. And here's a great example of that. His epistles, uh, especially 1 John, is very much like that. So, Jesus is saying, now, now that Judas is on his way to betray me, I'm going to be glorified because of that because of the betrayal that is setting in motion, not the actual betrayal itself, but the fact that it is setting in motion what is going to happen on the world's behalf. I'm going to die for the punishment of sin for the world. And of course, that's only applied. Not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody's sins are forgiven. Even though Jesus died for the sins of the world, it's only applied to us through our belief, our repentance from our sin, our belief in Jesus, what he did, and then moving forward from there. That It's that belief is, is what applies that work on the cross to us. And so he's saying, I am now glorified by what Judas has just left to go set in motion. I'm glorified by that. And God is glorified in me for doing what I'm about to do. And if God is glorified in me because of that, then God will also glorify me in himself. And if we just get this, you see this, this cyclical, this rolling, circular uh, way of him trying to explain to us and give us uh, information a little bit at a time as it keeps going around in a circle. Uh, it, it's just uh, 
pardon the pun, is glorious. And we see that Jesus is glorified, God is glorified, God is glorified in Jesus, and Jesus is glorified in God. It's, it's just a perfect picture of unity, as we will see in uh, later chapters when he talks about, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and we are one in unity. And then he also later says that uh, as believers, he brings us into that fold as well, into that unity. Uh, when he prays that high priestly prayer, Jesus does. Um, and he says, God, that I might be in them as I am in you and you in me, that they may be in us. And it's just, uh, that, again, that, that circular uh, explanation and description. Um, but here we see it, this unity, unbreakable unity between Christ and God the Father. I just want to take a moment here. We see glory is used so many times in these two verses. What is glory? Huh? I mean, it, it, it's such a common word, but it's, it's like right on the edge of, we use it all the time. It's not like we have to try and search for what is glory. Perhaps maybe we use one of um, its cognates a little more frequently when we say glorious. That's glorious, you know. But glory, what is glory? You go, hmm, what is glory? How is Jesus glorified in this? And how is God glorified through the Son being glorified in this and vice versa? What is with all this glory? The dictionary tells us, not that we should ever completely rely on the dictionary to explain words in Scripture, but because Scripture was written originally in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and it's translated into English for us, sometimes it's necessary to take a look at an English dictionary to try and figure out what does this word mean. And glory is defined as praise. Have you ever praised somebody? Maybe you've praised your, your, your son or your daughter when they came home with an A uh, on their spelling test from school. They were very nervous about it, and so you lavish praise on them. Um, or honor. In the same vein, you take that test with the big red A on there, and you Put it on the refrigerator. Put a magnet on there. You tape it up. Whatever it is you, you do. And uh, you're honoring them and their achievement in particular. Uh, glory might also be seen as some kind of a distinction uh, that's bestowed on somebody because of what they've done or who they are. Uh, so praise, honor, distinction for someone or some act or deed or some quality that is inherent within a person. This is what we, especially as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are to do. We are to glory, to shower Jesus and God the Father with glory, with praise, with honor with distinction. Honor being, uh, again, putting that test right up front in a high traffic area for all to see. We are honoring that person. It's put in first place. When we put God and the Lord Jesus Christ first place in our life, in each little area and category of our life, we are giving him honor. Honor is like opening the door for someone so that they can go through first, first place. Praise, lavishing, um, thanksgiving, and distinction upon someone for who they are, the quality of their being and what they've done. 
This is glory. There is a, and I forgot to look it up again, the, um, the year that this, this was done, and for some reason I want to say it was sometime in either the 17 or 1800s, not sure, so it's not real, real old, but it's older than me. So, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism was put out. Uh, think of it in terms of like a, a boot camp for good Catholic boys and girls to go through. Actually, it's for anybody. Um, when they are converted and they come to Christ in the Catholic um, Church, they are put into this rigorous training. And it used to be a lot more stringent than it is even today. And oh, how I wish uh, Baptist churches or even any Protestant churches would have something like this because I'm envious of it, although it does seem to make it a little too legalistic. But at any rate, when someone comes to Christ, they are put through this rigorous, over a hundred questions they are taught and trained to understand not just the answer to the question, but the scriptures that back it up. And the very first question on the Westminster Shorter Catechism, there's actually a longer one. <laughs> the shorter one has over a hundred questions. Uh, and question number one is, what is the chief end of man. We might ask the question a little differently. What is the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? They attempt to answer it very succinctly, directly, but short and sweet. The answer to what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. They kind of give a two-part answer. They snuck that second part in there. Chief end of man. What is the meaning of life? What is our purpose? Why are we still here drawing breath? to glorify God. What is glory? Praise, honor, distinction. Our job, our life, everything about our life, it's not for us uh, to get all we can out of life, to grab the brass ring, to pile up as many toys as we can, to um, achieve as many things as we can, to provide uh, this great inheritance for our children or our grandchildren. It's not about this. Quite simply, the meaning of life is to glorify God. Try putting that on Facebook and see what happens. <laughs> There are a couple of scripture references that help back this up. One is in 1 Corinthians 10.31, which states, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then we find in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, for from him, that is Christ, from him and through him and to him are all things. <laughs> to him be the glory forever. Amen. And that covers that first part. The second tag-on answer to what is the chief end of man, uh, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We can go to uh, Psalm 73, verses 24 through 26, which says, With your counsel, speaking of God, with your counsel you will guide me. And afterward, receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. My portion is a, a poetic way of saying my inheritance. What, what am I going to get out of all of this? What, what's in it for me? God. God is what's in it for us forever eternal life and also in John chapter 17 verses 20 through 24 and I only go so far back up because this is a part of what we're going to be coming to that high priestly prayer that Jesus prays uh, I like how he says this in verse 20 and it does us good to remember this because one could easily think that a lot of the things Jesus says in the Gospels apply only to his disciples, and I mean the 12 disciples, and it does not. And this verse, and this verse alone, is all that's necessary to prove that everything he wrote, with few exceptions that were obviously so specifically for one or more of the 12, but here he says in verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. And then here's really the only verse that's given uh, under the answer for the shorter catechism. But I just had to, that other section is just so great I had to read it. <laughs> He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus is saying, all those who believe in me, all my disciples, not just the twelve, but all those who become disciples through their teaching that they may all be with me where I am glory hallelujah okay so that's glory and that's what we see here Jesus says now has the time come for me to be glorified and God will be glorified in me and uh, if he is glorified then I will be glorified in him and on and on okay so that's glory that is glory now we come to verse 33. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now he did say this already once before. He said it in John chapter 7, verses 33 through 34 where he says, Therefore Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you. Then, and he gives more information here, Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. And if that's all we ever had to read, we would wonder, oh, Excuse me? What do you mean I cannot come? Ever? Doesn't that kind of defeat the whole purpose of becoming a believer in Christ and becoming one of his disciples? Because i got to tell you, if, if changing my whole life to live for God only matters in this life only, you can have it. But our greatest hope, the greatest promise that God could ever give us is forgiveness from sin and life eternal with him. If there was no life eternal, Paul says it himself, 
eat, drink, and be merry. But that's not it. He has given us, and it's said literally, it seems like countless times in the New Testament, life eternal for the believer. Life everlasting. But I gotta ask, you know, what does Jesus mean by this then? What does he mean? And so I look at Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. And he says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And so now we read something like that, and then even back in uh, Deuteronomy, Chapter 4, verse 29. He tells us something a little bit different. He says, but from there, God is speaking here to uh, the Israelites, but from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. Now, does it not seem like there's a little bit of a contradiction here? Well, actually, there's not. Because it is referring to two different things. Jesus, when he says, uh, you will look for me but not find me, and where I'm going, you cannot come. The first part, you will seek for me but not find me, he's referring to his physical body. Because he is going to ascend into heaven. You will seek for me, but... I'm the greatest hide-and-seeker there ever was. You are not going to find me. But, as we just read in, the, in, in that portion of the, uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer to God, he says, I in them. So, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, where do you look for Christ? Within. He is in communion, in, in unity with your spirit. He is there. Though you cannot see him right now, you can look for him everywhere and you will not see his body, his form, but he is in you. So when he says, you will seek for me, but you will not find me, he's just letting his disciples know. He's preparing them that I'm no longer going to be physically walking down the dusty roads of Jerusalem with you any longer. I'm not going to be with you in that way anymore. And then where I am going, you cannot come. Well, we're going to see here a little later that he just means now. Where I go, you cannot come right now. But you will. And he says that a little later uh, in this passage. So we have that. You will seek, but you will not find, and you can't follow. And then I just love this, and this is where I get the title of this sermon, this section that we're coming to now. Again, keeping in mind the review, he just washed all their feet. He just disclosed who the betrayer is going to be. And now, with all of that just floating in the air, it, it would be a wonder if the disciples could concentrate on anything else. And now he just drops this bomb again. You will seek for me, but not find me. And where I go, you cannot follow. How could you pay attention to anything else that's said after that? But it's right here that he issues this next sentence. And let's remember that it is Jesus Christ who is saying it. The Son of the living God who is saying it. The Messiah is saying it. God in the flesh is saying this. The God of all the Israelites, since the, the time that they were being called as just one man and woman, Abraham, and Sarah, when he led them to the promised land. All those commands that 
God had given. Some 1,500 or more years ago, all of the commands that he has given through the millennia, Jesus, the Son of God, now says, right after he dropped this bombshell on him, he says, a new command I give you. And you're like, what? Jesus, let my head stop swimming from what you just said. But now you're about to say there's a brand new command? Is it going to be as big as one of the ten? Or is it going to be one of the, the, the Levite commands? Or, or one about civil commands like not moving a boundary stone or things like that? What kind of a command is it? And what do you mean I can't find you? I'm only going to be with you a little while longer. What do you mean I can't follow you? A new command, what? And so he continues. <clears throat> that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this... All men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A new command. And I once read where a pastor new to a church, he was just called, he, he began to preach this sermon to the congregation. And the congregation loved it. Gave him all kinds of kudos, pats on the back after the service. Uh, they even talked about it through the week and they couldn't wait for next Sunday. When he got up, he preached the same message again. And they thought that strange. Did we just hire somebody with Alzheimer's? What's going on? Can he remember that he just preached this? Or maybe he thought we liked it so much he thought he would do it again. Third week, he preached the same message. The message was on love. This message. The fourth week, he preached it again. Finally, the board just had to confront him saying, what are you doing? Why are you preaching the same message over and over again? And he said, I'm going to keep preaching this message until we get it right. Because until we do, until we obey this commandment to love one another, how can we dare? We can't move on. Until we begin to do this, we can't really be the church or the people of God. Now, this, I'm assuming, was a fictitious example. Nevertheless, the truth behind it is so powerful. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach this again <laughs> next week. But, but the truth is there to love one another. Okay, so uh, that just begs the question, what is love? You know, the feelings that you have, the feelings of love uh, that you know, give you those tinglies towards someone or, uh, you know, we, we so overuse the word today, you know, I love pizza or I love ice cream or I love my new car or I love riding the roller coaster. We use love for everything just to describe how much we really like something or enjoy something. But that's describing a feeling that we have. You ever stop to think that you cannot command a feeling? Unless you're a director giving stage direction to a really good actor, other than that, you cannot command a feeling. You know, cry, laugh, mm -hmm. you know, be sad, be depressed. These are feelings that wash over us, like we have no control sometimes over our feelings and they don't work on cue. This is a command, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. 
You can't command a feeling, which means you cannot command a noun form of love. But the verb form, you can command the verb form of love because it's an action. And let's just take a moment uh, to, to try and explain uh, all this about love. Uh, first of all, in Matthew 5.44, we read Jesus saying, But I say to you, love your enemies. Oh, come on, Jesus. Why'd you put that in there? You get that? Your enemies. The people you are convinced hate you and are trying to ruin you. Love them. And pray for those who persecute you based on your religious faith belief. Those who persecute you, and we are seeing this escalate exponentially here in this country. And it's only going to get gooder and gooder from here. Persecution is going to come in droves. It's coming. I am the last one. I, I do not like saying this. I don't like it when other people say it. I'm not a chicken little, the sky is falling kind of person. I don't like to uh, jump out there and predict <coughs> things, especially doom and gloom. But persecution is coming to America. Persecution is already here, and it's just going to gain traction as it becomes more and more popular to do so. Are we ready? Just meeting here on a Sunday morning, perhaps in our lifetime, will come with consequences just to gather together as God's people. So we are to love our enemies and actually pray for those who are persecuting us. No vengeance or grudges. You take a look back at Leviticus 19.18. That was a good year, a very good year. <laughs> Chapter 19, verse 18, God uh, says through Moses, You shall not take vengeance. Uh, you know what that means, right? It's not up to us to even the score. It's not up to us to level the playing field. It's not up to us to give a little back once we feel we've been gotten. Vengeance, no matter to what degree, no matter how deserving or justified you think the situation calls for, God simply says, with no situational ethics here involved, he just simply says, blanket statement, you shall not take vengeance. Of course, elsewhere he says, vengeance is mine. But here he says, um, you shall not take vengeance, nor shall you bear any grudge against the sons of your people. A grudge? Why can't I hold a grudge? See, that's taken the whole idea and action of vengeance to the realm of the mind. Okay, so I'm not actually acting out on my vengeance, but come on, can't I, can't I continue to have bad feelings or misgivings about someone? No. Again, God issues a blanket statement. No situational ethics can justify any exceptions. God says, no grudge. You shall not bear any grudge. Why? He answers that. Because you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then in Galatians 5.14. Not 5.4. 5.14. I thought I had it up there wrong. <coughs> Uh, we find 
For the whole law, all the law from Genesis 1-1 to Revelations 21, I forget the ending verse. The whole law, everything, every command from God that has been revealed to us, spoken or written, is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, God is telling us, go learn what that means. And it means love and pray for your enemies and those who persecute you. It means taking no vengeance, not even bearing any grudge toward anyone. Uh, and then in 1 Peter 1.22, 1.22, it says, uh, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, and here comes the command, fervently love one another from the heart. So we don't even get to fake it. Fervently, urgently, with zealous zeal, fervently, consistently, continuously, fervently, that's the idea behind fervent, fervently love one another, but you can't even do it by faking it. It has to be sincere from the heart. This is love. So what, what is this commandment that Jesus has given us? This new commandment to love one another? Love and pray for your enemies. No vengeance, no grudgment, uh, grudges. Fervently love one another from the heart. And then in 1 John 4, 7. Beloved. Let us love one another, for love is from God. So I can't even manufacture love. Love has to be given to me from God. So how can you love your enemy? You can't. But God can through you. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Wow. Wish he hadn't added those last two phrases to that. I get it that for love is from God. I like that. That helps, helps make some of these other explanations and commands about love a little more understandable. But everyone who does love is actually born of God. In other words, a disciple, a follower, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is born of God and knows God. There is no love without God. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And I'm taking a look at verse 10. You're going to want to add that too. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. See, the whole idea there in that passage is that <clears throat> John is actually mincing no words here. He's basically saying, if, if you do not love your brother, a fellow believer in Christ, then you are not a believer in Christ. Extremely harsh words, unsettling to me, in my mind. But there it is. Perhaps, you know, right up there with some of the hardest teachings in Scripture. So when we come to the Lord's table to partake of communion, and we're told to examine ourselves, one of the ways we can examine ourselves is, have I been showing, demonstrating love 
for all my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I, have I taken any vengeance? Am I bearing any grudges, any ill will, any reservations about someone? Because if you are, you are not showing the love of God and you are not in the light like you think you are. You are still in the darkness, John says. Ouch. And then the last, <clears throat> the last item here is uh, in 1 John 3, 16 through 18. And then uh, picking up verse 23 as well. 1 John 3, 16 We know love by this. This is how we know love. That Jesus laid down his life for us. He didn't just write it down. He didn't just say it. He did it. Love, the kind of love that's commanded in scripture is not a noun. It's not a feeling, it's an action verb. That he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods, i.e. possessions, money, what have you, and sees his brother in need, and then closes his heart against him, then how does the love of God abide in him? The answer is it doesn't. Love for the brethren. Love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the saints. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And then down to verse 23. This is his commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's where it all begins. That's how you become a saint. That's how you become a believer. A brother or sister in the Lord is the belief. But he doesn't end there. This is his commandment. That you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and... Love one another, just as he commanded us. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just read the next three verses in our main passage. Uh, and w without any digging into it, I've covered what I wanted to cover, and that's on love. But verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, skipping over the whole new commandment thing, he said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. And it's like, you come to that section and you breathe. It's like, I, if I don't like the reading up there when he says, uh, where I'm going, you cannot follow, you cannot come up in verse 33. Now we understand here. Later, you will come later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you? <laughs> will you lay down your life for me, Peter? Truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, a rooster will not Crow until you deny me three times. Because remember, in just hours, Jesus is going to be handed over, he goes into trial, and then the next day he's executed. If you want to learn more about love and, and what's commanded of us to do, There's a lot more description for you in 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter. And it tells us a lot. See, it doesn't matter if you can speak 
or sing like an angel. Because if you don't have love, you're nothing. You can have all the faith in the world, enough faith, more than just a mustard seed, but huge, God-given, gift-sized faith that you can move mountains. But if you don't have love, you are nothing. It says, verse 1 and verse 2, and then verse 3 comes and says, listen, you can give away all your possessions and show the whole world that you don't care about anything in this world, and that all you care about is God, but if you don't have love, you are nothing. Love. Then it gives all these things that love is and what love is not. And it contrasts and compares the two together. And then it ends with the end. He says, all these things, like uh, speaking in tongues like the angels and the faith that can move mountains and having lots of possessions and then giving them away, all these things are temporal and they will all pass away with use, it says. But there are three things that abide and will abide forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of the three is love. And it's commanded. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word and this new commandment. God, may it just register with me, with each one of us, just how vital, how important this idea of love is and to what extent and degree it is that you are calling us to demonstrate this love, especially here in your church at First Baptist especially here in your church with other saints, other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. To what extent you have called us to love. Show us, God, I pray. Bless us, take care of us, keep us safe, and give us your peace throughout this coming week. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John 10, 27 says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Let's stand as we sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. With your blessing in Christ's name, amen. You are dismissed.